God is good. All the time and all the time, God is good. Welcome to Lexington United Methodist Church. We are happy to have you here in worship with us today. For those of you who may not know me yet, I am Pastor Meejan Gossard. I am the associate pastor here at Lexington, and I am thrilled to come and worship with all of you this morning. And now we will have our welcome and announcements. Good morning. Thank you, Pastor Meejan. Uh, so I, I was going to cheat a little bit because I could say Pastor Meejan or Pastor, her last name, but you have two very difficult names. I do. I do. So Pastor Meejan, good morning and welcome to the second Sunday in Lent and to spring in South Carolina. Remember, coats today, flip-flops tomorrow. As we uh, go through this very special time of year, this holy time of year that we prepare for Easter. Some announcements this morning. Uh, remember the traditional things that are going on in our church like this week with opportunities for worship and fellowship. Uh, Tuesday evening services at 6.30 here and a Zoom Bible study also on Tuesday. Uh, there's an adult Bible study uh, by using Max Lucado's book, uh, God Never Gives Up On You, that begins today. Uh, this time of year, time flies by, so the Lexington United Methodist Women's Spring Retreat, which will be in April, the last day to sign up for that is today. So keep that in mind. Deposits are due today. If you're looking at the bulletin and it says you got to do it by February 25th and you think you have time, February 25th is today. <laughs> Uh, special thanks for coffee time, and everybody's invited to coffee time uh, after the service today and before Sunday school. Thank you to the Emmaus group for providing that this month. Uh, there's also a, a reminder in your bulletin about the Sam and Andy Lloyd George scholarship, uh, and, the, and the reminder for that, the deadline is March 21st. Remember, Habitat for Humanity. Uh, if you have any questions or would like to be involved in that, get in touch with Mike Mitten. Also, the Apaca shoebox is uh, going on, and this month we're focusing on washcloths, hand towels, bar soap, plastic soap holders, toothbrushes, and toothbrush holders. No toothpaste, but uh, so be prayerful of that. A reminder of some church business going on uh, this um, next Thursday, not this coming Thursday, but the next Thursday, March 7th. At 5.30 will be a meeting of the church council, so if you're involved in church council, uh, you're encouraged to attend. And Children's Corner, a lot of things are going on, including today, Baking with Faith, uh, and some volunteers are still needed uh, for that and some upcoming things. Also, mark the calendar for March 24th, after the 11 o'clock services, where there'll be the traditional Easter egg hunt and then summer camps that are going on uh, throughout the season and this summer. You have two inserts in your bulletin, uh, one regarding the midweek meal uh, and another announcement on the back about Lenten readers, but the midweek wheel, meal uh, starting March 13th. And again, March is not a long time away. March is Friday. Uh, and then the Easter lily order form is also in your, an insert in your bulletin. Those are due by March the 10th. Uh, so are there any other announcements that need to come before the congregation at this time? Hearing none, let's continue our worship this morning with the prelude.
Good morning. morning. On Sunday morning, for a brief space of time, we leave behind the world of home and work and school. The world where we have our list of things to do, activities to participate in, tasks to complete. We come here this morning seeking something else. We come here seeking a shift from the ordinary to the sacred, from doing to being. I invite you to close your eyes, let go of your list. Remember that it is the season of Lent. Remember the parable of the sower. The sower throws the seed and where it lands determines if it will grow or not grow. Think of it this way. Think of the season of Lent as the sower, the time when seeds of faith are thrown with special intensity, as a time when God calls us in a low, urging voice. Listen, Jesus is being drawn to Jerusalem. Where is God calling you to? What is God calling you to do? As we extinguish this light, We acknowledge the darkness and pain of injury done to the earth and its ecosystems. Let us pray. Loving God, as we journey through this holy season of Lent, may we be open to your presence. Give us the strength to make the changes that are needed in our lives and the courage to take on the work of transforming the world. Amen. Before we do our Psalter reading, if you are wondering where Pastor Mac is, he's going to be preaching at the contemporary service, so he's not sick or anything. We, we plan to swap services today, because um, I don't see him in here, so I just want to let you guys know. Please stand as you are able for our Psalter reading. It can be found in your hymnal on page 752, and we will be singing the second response. <clears throat> you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you, the praise of Israel, are enthroned in holiness. If you, our forebears, trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved, and you they trusted and were not disappointed. and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me, they wag their ears. He committed his cause to the Lord, yet the Lord deliver him. Let the Lord rescue him, for the Lord delights in him. And since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. I am poured out like water. 
My heart is like wax. It is melted within my prayers. My mouth is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue cleaves for my jaws. Indeed, dogs surround me. I can count all my bones. They divide my garments among them. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. For dominion belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. And all who go down to the dust shall bow before the Lord, and I shall live for God. Each generation shall tell of the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn. Let us affirm our faith by saying the Apostles' Creed. It can be found in your hymnal on page 881. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son of our Savior, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 598, O Word of God Incarnate.
seated. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to ask the children to come join me down front. All right, well, good morning, everybody. I'm so glad that you're here today. You know, sometimes I think that we can get the wrong picture in our heads about what Jesus is like and what it was like to be one of his really good friends. I know that I can. I mean, I love Jesus, and I know that Jesus loves me, but sometimes I imagine that being with Jesus way back in Bible times was always peaceful and always happy. But you know, Sometimes, even when we're with people that we love the most, we can get into arguments. And we have to remember, Jesus had these emotions too. Brothers and sisters fight, kids and their grown-ups sometimes yell at each other, and people who really love each other still can get really frustrated at each other, don't you think? If someone tells you that you did something completely wrong, it can feel like they're angry at you. And that feels pretty bad, especially if they decide to call you names. But just because people have arguments or get frustrated or mad or angry, it doesn't mean that they don't still love each other. And this really reminds me of our scripture lesson this morning. So let's hear our scripture from Mark in a storybook format. One day, Jesus and his friends were talking. Hey guys, Jesus said, there's something coming up that you really need to know about. Now, listen carefully. We're gonna go up to Jerusalem and I'm gonna get arrested. People are going to do really mean things to me. They're going to hurt my body. And then, just then, Peter interrupted him. Uh, Jesus, Peter said, just a minute. You and I need to talk. Jesus said, can it wait, Pete? I'm kind of in the middle of something important. Now, as I was saying, after they arrest me and hurt my body, they're actually going to put me on a cross. And then, but then Peter interrupted again. Look, Jesus, he said, I said we need to talk right now. And he grabbed Jesus by the arm and pulled him away from the others. Okay, Peter, said Jesus, what's up? Here's the deal, said Peter. You shouldn't be talking about all this scary stuff. You're saying you're going to get arrested and hurt and worse? That's just not okay. John and Mary are going to totally freak out. Thomas is probably going to lose his faith in you. And who knows what Judas will do? You've got to stop it. <sighs> wow, said Jesus. Seems like you're pretty upset. Of course I'm upset, said Peter. I'm mad at you. Plus, it's not even going to happen. We would never let bad stuff like that happen to you. Well, Peter, you know what? I'm mad at you, too, said Jesus. Me, asked Peter. Why are you mad at me? Because, said Jesus, you're trying to stop me from doing what God wants me to do. You aren't acting like my friend. You're acting like my enemy. Yeah, you're the evil one. Evil one, said Peter. That's a mean name. You hurt my feelings. Peter, said Jesus, you can't stop me from doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm telling you all of these hard things because they're going to happen. I want you to be ready. I don't want you to be surprised. I want to keep you from being scared too. Wait, Jesus, so all this stuff really is gonna happen, said Peter? That's right, said Jesus. I know it's all confusing now, but this is how I'm going to help the whole world. So Peter was mad at Jesus. Peter told Jesus he was totally wrong. And Jesus was mad at Peter. He even called him the evil one. But you know what? If we continue reading, Jesus and Peter still really loved each other. They were still really good friends. Let's pray together. God, thank you for Jesus who stayed true to his path and by doing this, teaches us to always follow you, even when people sometimes get mad about it. 
Thank you for reminding us that it's okay to get angry because when all calms, love remains. Amen. Sorry, I forgot if my microphone was on. Thank you, Pam, that was gorgeous. Thank you so much. So I've gone back and forth with this all week um, as we come to our time of prayer. I am not as comfortable as Pastor Ma as Mike, Matt saying all of the prayer requests out loud because our service is live streamed. So what I'm gonna say is if you would like the email that has all of our prayer concerns in it, you can email the office or Pastor Mac and he will add you to it. And if you're already on it, then you got them this morning around 5 a.m. So let us go to God in prayer. Good and gracious God, we are here this morning to worship you, to get rid of all of the distractions in our life, to have a moment when we can just think of you, put all our attention on you, because we do know that this blessed assurance, we know that Jesus is ours. We are so grateful for that glory, the spirit. God, this message this morning, it is your story, but it is also our story and our song that we go out and tell people how we praise our Savior every day, all the day long. And even in the midst of our praise, we still have confusion and questions. We have things we don't understand. We have things we don't agree on. But God, we are still able to praise you. Praise you that we woke up. Praise you for the sun. Praise you for good weather for a couple days off from school, for our kids, for work. God, 
we could go on and on and on. And we thank you so much for this season of Lent, this weird season in our church calendar where we are reminded about the importance of fasting and prayer and focusing on you as we journey towards the cross. We offer up this prayer, God, and we offer up the prayer and praise requests that we have in our hearts. We know that you hear them all. And we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to our time of offering, I have a question for you. What will it profit for us if we gain the whole world and forfeit our life? With all of our humility, let us make our offering to God, trusting not in worldly gain, but in God's sustaining grace. And I would ask the ushers to come forward, please. Almighty God, we give you thanks for this day and these offerings. We ask that you may bless them so that they may serve our community and our world. Amen. Please remain standing for our hymn of praise, number 534, Be Still My Soul.
gospel reading, I just want to let you all know the last hymn is changing. Um, it's going to be 5.30, are you, are you able? And I'll remind you at the end. If you will learn anything, you will learn I'm a very spirit-led pastor. And I don't know the last hymn, so I don't want to sing something we don't know. <laughs> All right, our gospel lesson today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. It can be found in your pew Bibles in the New Testament on page 41. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders the chief priest and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. As I said at the beginning of the service, I am very excited to be with all of you here this morning as we get to know each other. It has been fun during, uh, the, I guess it was last week, week before, when we had the pancake supper and I looked around and went, I don't know who most of these people are. So something you don't know about me when I preach is often I'm barefoot. And I am barefoot right now. And that is because I believe preaching and sharing the word is a very special moment. And that we are all on holy ground, and I take that from back when Moses and God told him through the burning bush, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. And so if someone asked why was Pastor Meejan barefoot, it's because we're in a holy, holy moment. And we find ourselves today in the second week of Lent. I was talking with a friend this week, and we were talking about the Lenten season and realized there's not a lot of good hymns for Lent. There's really just the one, and you probably know it very well. Lord, who out these 40 days for us did fast and pray, teach us with thee to mourn our sins and close by these to stay. It is a wonderful reminder as we are in this season of Lent, these 40 days, which may seem like a lifetime and may feel like they are flying by. And I love this time of the year. I love the Lenten season when we intentionally take this time to slow down and to remember to repent and to renew and to Restore when we take these times to focus on reading scripture or fasting. If you gave up something for Lent, you are fasting this season. And we hear this message throughout the year of read your scripture and pray daily and all of that. But it just, for me, it seems to hit differently in Lent. And maybe because that's the time of year where we expect to hear these kinds of messages. But I've noticed this year as we... And as I and you are taking this walk with Jesus to the cross, there's something different about Lent. And I can't put my finger on it, and it's annoying me. I don't enjoy it as much as usual. It's not clicking. Something is off. Something seems wrong, and I cannot figure it out. I mean, I can come up with excuses and reasons. Well, maybe it's not clicking because I just started here. 
in January, so almost two months now, and I'm feel, still figuring things out, and we've had, I think, five funerals since then, and we've got this big thing on Saturday with the whole district coming here and learning the rhythm and the method and all of that thing. It could be my office is what I call organized chaos, and that is thanks to all the pastors who came before me who did not clean out their files. <laughs> could be the new commute time. I live in Northeast Columbia. Could be just being so busy. And it is normal as a pastor to work on multiple projects all at once. This is not a new thing to feel like I'm doing 10 things at once, but yet it still feels off. And so I know that something is distracting me, but I don't know what that is. And just like the excuses for why it's not the same, I can give lots of reasons for why I'm distracted. For instance, when am I ever going to finish watching The Crown? I don't want to watch the last season on Netflix because then I know it will be over. Will laundry ever be finished? We're planning ahead for Easter and summer. I'm making sure everything is on my calendar. And yet, I'm distracted. And maybe it's because in this time of doing Lent and taking all this time to focus on are you doing your spiritual practices, I go home at night and I'm like, all right, God, I'm good. I spent all day with you at work and I will see you tomorrow. <laughs> but it's got to be more than just a quick, I spent some time with you today. And we all get distracted and we all have questions and we all wonder. And so we get to this season of Lent, this time to remember. I mean, I'm just ready to jump ahead to Easter. I was so excited when our Lenten reader just started blowing out all the candles. I was like, yes, we're going to jump ahead. <clears throat> but we have to wait. We're only in week two. As we slowly move into the darkness, as we get to Holy Week where we wave palm branches and sing hallelujah, and then by Friday, Jesus is crucified, and on Easter morning, he's raised from the dead, and we are all excited. But I think some of this year, which has been weird, is I feel like we are repeating the same text that we've already done this year. You know, two weeks ago, we did Transfiguration on the Mountain, and I shared the text we read this morning with the new service and the Tuesday night service because you need the context. Because this happens six days before the Transfiguration event happens on the top of the mountain. We've already done Baptism of the Lord, and yet last week, Mark's, our Mark passage was about baptism and Mark's wonderful two-sentence summary of Jesus being out in the wilderness and being tempted. And so now we are back to this text, this confusing, confusing text that me and my colleagues, we hate to preach on, but I love Heather's version, so I hope you listened when she shared it as a story time because it was like, oh, I get it, it clicks. But it is, it is a confusing text. This idea of we've got to take up our cross. And we've all heard it and we've said it, but what does it really mean? Does it mean that we need to go out and get cross necklaces or Christian t-shirts or a bumper sticker or a fish for our car or some kind of bracelet? The WWJD bracelets aren't as popular as they used to be. What would Jesus do? But what is this cross we have to carry? Is it a sign that we give to the world? Is it carrying around a literal cross? There have been some people who have done that, who have taken a cross and walked it across the country. Um, I don't want to do that. I have no upper body strength, and it would not go well. I don't even think I'd make it down the aisle. So I want an option B because I don't like option A. I don't like this idea of pain and suffering. I don't like this idea of taking up our cross. I want it easy. If only it was easy. I feel like I say that every single Sunday. I have yet to find the passage in the scriptures that promise when we said yes to Christ, our life would be easy. Instead, we're talking about this confusing taking up our cross and, and our burdens. And it's just like, what is this? And if we're honest, we have all disagreed with Jesus at some point. Maybe not on this text, but maybe on something different. 
And we don't understand, why won't Jesus see our world the way we do? Why does he keep saying this is how we're supposed to live when the world tells us something completely different? I mean, we can all come up with scenarios without having to give a bunch of examples. How we all do this. How we want to follow the world. I don't care how many spiritual groups you follow on Instagram, you will eventually get in the Instagram wormhole that is no longer feeding your soul. Getting lost in the comments on Facebook while it may be fun and entertaining for all of us, how is that spreading the gospel message of love, of joy and peace? And so maybe when we are doing those things and we don't think about it, maybe we're rebuking Jesus as well. I mean, we're not quite like Peter shouting out and saying to him that he, where was it? How, well, we don't know what Peter said. We just know that Jesus rebuked him and said, get behind me, Satan. So it could not have been good. And just a few verses before our text this morning, in verses 27 through 30, Mark wrote, Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist and others, Elijah and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And then Jesus sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Peter gets it right. Yes, Jesus, you are the Messiah, the appointed one of God, the one who is supposed to come and restore God's people. And Peter is right, yet Peter doesn't quite understand. You see, he has an image of what the Messiah is supposed to do. And who the Messiah is supposed to be. We have heard how it was said, you know, well, this can't be Jesus. What king is born in a manger? And I think we all have our own images and wishes about who Jesus is and what he should do. I end up thinking of Jesus a lot of like the Jesus portrayed in movies. He's got brown curly hair and sandals and some kind of white cloth robe outfit. The disciples following him, he's got this very sweet, calming presence and voice about him. And I like that Jesus. I like the Jesus that is casting out demons, that is healing the sick, feeding the multitudes, doing miracles. I like that Jesus. I bet you like that Jesus too. And we want to follow that Jesus because he is our Lord and Savior. We don't always like it when he tells us and calls us to do something that pushes us outside of our comfort zone or that we really just want to say, is there an option B or C or D? Is there an option of none of the above? Because I don't want to do any of the above. And no matter how much we try, Jesus will not conform to our image of who we think he is or who we want him to be. He is the savior of the world. He did die on the cross for all of our sins. That cannot be denied. It's something we all agree upon. But yet, we all have a choice to make. And it's every day we have that choice to make. He is telling his disciples what the future holds, what it's going to look like. How he's got to undergo great suffering and be rejected. Well, what savior of the world is going to be rejected and have suffering? He's got angels who can take him away. But every day we wake up, we go through our lives, and we have these moments where we have to decide, what are we going to do? Are we going to deny Jesus and follow the ways of the world? Or are we going to take up our cross and follow him? 
which may mean not following the world's ways, which are so easy, but being a little different, sharing those fruits of the Spirit, sharing that love of Christ within us, with others, sharing that joy that we have even when everything around us seems just like it's the end and the worst, still having that hope we have, it is contradictory to what the world teaches us. As Christians, the focus is not all about me, me, me. What can I do? What, what is it that I'm going to do? It's about Jesus. It is about following God and the Holy Spirit. It is about being pushed outside our comfort zones and trying new things, doing things we never thought we would ever do. When I went to seminary, Candler has a lot, at that time, had a lot of students that were second career. So it was very weird to be the young one in the group. And so many of my colleagues shared the same story. I felt God calling me to ministry, but I said no, and I ran away, and I kept trying to run away, but eventually I couldn't run anymore. Taking up our cross does not mean that we are running from Christ, although some days we might. There are days I also run and hide. But it means that we are willing to risk our life for the sake of another. We are willing to lose our life for the sake of the gospel. The way of Jesus is self-denial, and it reminds us that our life is not our own. Our lives belong to God. If you were here on Ash Wednesday, or if you did the drive through you came through and one of the pastors or Heather put a cross on your forehead. And we said two different things. We said, remember, well, three. Because at the Wednesday night service, Max said, remember your baptism. And I said, from dust you came and from dust you shall return. Heather taught me a new one about stardust, which I liked. But we are not in control. And that is hard if you are like me and who likes to be in control of everything. I'm planning the worship service for next Saturday morning, and my dad, I was telling him about all these things I was doing, and he's like, did you get in the weeds too much? And I wanted to just be like, hello, former head of worship for 13 years. Why would I ever get in the weeds of worship planning? And I told him, yes, I did. So that way, nothing goes wrong on the day, and we're ready, and we're prepared. And if I have learned anything about ministry, it is that when the worship service comes, something is probably going to go wrong that you can't prepare for. And you live in that awkwardness, and you live in that moment, and you let it breathe, and you realize it's all okay. Because we're all a little awkward at times. So when we talk about self-denial, it's not about being out of control or powerless. It is about the choices we make. Think about Jesus' life and how he lived it. And yes, I'm not crazy, and I know our world today is very, very, very different from the world in Jesus' time. I know that we live in the South, and one of the most common questions when you meet somebody is, hi, how are you, and what church do you go to? And if you don't like our church, there's one literally across the street. And if you don't like that one, there's a Lutheran one down that way a block or so. You know, the South, banks and churches on every corner. But even though the worlds are very different, some things are still the same. Jesus spread messages of hope. He performed miracles. He worked on the Sabbath when they said no. He heard those. He saw those that most people just brushed aside. My favorite, one of my favorites is Zacchaeus, and it's probably because I learned that song when I was a child about Zacchaeus being a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. And he climbed up in a tree, and Jesus saw him in the tree and said, I'm coming to your house today. And I would freak out. I'd be like, my house is not ready, Jesus. I have piles of laundry and dishes, and I don't cook, so we're going to have to find something to order. 
It is easy to get caught in the weeds. It is easy to get caught up in the details. It is easy to get distracted. And that's what I think it means about taking up our cross. I think it doesn't mean necessarily having to wear a certain necklace or shirt. It doesn't mean having something telling others and if you like wearing Christian shirts and necklaces and everything, go for it. I like it too. But it's about our actions. It's about the words that we say. It is about the way that we treat other people. It is the way that we, even though we disagree, I'm not gonna make your, raise your hands, don't worry. But I'm sure there are some people in here who believe the only true news source is CNN, others who think it's Fox News, and maybe a couple of you who think it's MSNBC, and a couple more who are like me and will only listen to the network nightly news because it's 30 minutes and it covers everything. <laughs> and yet we are still able to do ministry together in this church. We do wonderful ministry. We opened up our gym a couple weeks ago and a mother-son dance happened. Every Tuesday, the snack sack crew packs tons of bags of food to feed our children. We have a group that makes cards once a month to send to our homebound members. We have the Lexington Reaches Everyone to make sure all of our members are getting in contact with somebody. We are looking out into our world and our community to see what is going on and what are the needs here. We have a blessing box to help feed those in our community who don't have something to eat. I could go on and on and I've only been here since January. We have amazing volunteers. We have amazing gifts for ministry right here. All of you have a gift for ministry even if you don't know what it is yet. And maybe you do know what it is and you want to say, um, can I have another gift, please? Mm -hmm. One of my gifts is administration. And there are days when I would like to say, can I please have the gift of being more extroverted? I'm very introverted. And so I'm very awkward when I meet new people. I'm not good with small talk. I would much rather have the gift of small talk than administration. But I've learned administration is very important. What gifts have you learned that you have over the years? What ways have you taken up your cross? What ways will you continue to take up your cross and follow Jesus? Yes, the wording in the passage is confusing, but it's actually kind of simple. Jesus is giving all of the disciples a heads up of what's about to come. He's basically telling them the end to the movie. It's basically a giant spoiler alert. And yet, it's still a reminder for us today what we too are called to do, as we also are one of Christ's disciples. So I encourage you to continue to take up your cross and carry it with you and to live out that life so when other people see you, they wonder, why are you so different? And you can tell them why you have hope when all seems hopeless, why you have joy when all is sadness, why you have love and peace and kindness and goodness and all of those things, and tell them about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand as you are able for our final hymn, number 530, Are Ye Able?
guilty. Go out and be that beacon. Go out and share the light and love of Christ with others. Go out into this dark world and remind people about the love of God, the power of Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Go forth in peace in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.